Since 1989, Canada's first televised motorcycle magazine has been covering everything on two wheels. We've sampled new motorcycles from around the globe, toured North America from coast to coast, and interviewed some of the most interesting people on two wheels. So get set to keep your right hand cranked as Toyota Truck presents Motorcycle Experience. Hello and welcome to Motorcycle Experience, the voice of motorcyclists everywhere. I'm Dave Hatch and this week we've got a great show for you, including a road test of Honda's new middleweight cruiser contender, the VT750 Shadow Arrow. Also this week, my good friend Norm Wells and I will bring you yet another entry in our BMW Motorrad Ultimate Riding Tour Diary from Newfoundland. Last week, we kicked off the second leg of our journey by riding north from St. John's to the picturesque fishing village of Trinity. Today, we continue our exploration of the region with a visit to Bonavista. And speaking of ultimate rides, remember last week we kicked off round three in our best of six Ultimate Challenge series? Well, my arch rival Brian Hudgen got lost in the Ganaraska Forest because he just didn't know how to use a GPS. This week, we're introducing him to an expert who just might be able to lend Brian a hand. Plus, later on, Aliki Carrion will continue her series on learning to ride by also heading to the woods, while our roving reporter Paul Connert will introduce us to yet another faithful viewer. But first, we start the show with our Ride of the Week, Honda Canada's middleweight classic cruiser, the VT750 Aero. When it comes to V-twin riding, over the past decade, Honda Canada certainly has taken the middleweight cruiser category very seriously. Currently, Honda has five cruisers on offer in this division. Everything from classic roadsters to custom lowriders, blacked out muscle cruisers to this guy. The top of Honda's 750 lineup, the retro classic VT750 Aero. Under the Aero's 14-liter fuel tank, you'll find a liquid-cooled, fuel-injected, 745cc long-stroke V-twin power plant that is fed by a single 34-millimeter throttle body. To help maximize combustion, each of those cylinders sports dual spark plugs and three valves, while beautiful staggered dual exhausts handle the result of all that spent air and fuel. When it comes to pulling out the stops, Honda hasn't held back there either. The VT comes stock with an ABS braking system that delivers one of the best linked front and rear braking systems out there. So the Aero looks great, sounds good, and stops very well, but as always, you don't have to take my word for it. Here now is this week's guest road tester, lifelong Goldwing owner and former CMA riding instructor, Ken Edick. I've known you as a Goldwing rider for as long as I've known you. Have you ridden many cruisers lately? Got to be honest with you, it's my first cruiser ride of any significant uh, riding experience and I loved it. <laughs> I had a complete attitude change about how I ride. Number one, I was sitting so low I felt in the bike as opposed to on it. Yeah. And I've ridden multi-cylinder bikes of four cylinders and six cylinders for so long. I was a little apprehensive with a twin Yeah. because uh, I can't remember my last twin. So smooth, but there's the character of a twin. I immediately heard it in the exhaust system and, and the feel of the whole bike. Just loved it. And I guess the last uh, big difference was you weren't surrounded by a fairing. How did you like having the wind in your face? It was, it was uh, simplistic and yet it was the, the true element of motorcycle riding, this wind in your face experience that everybody talks about. That's what I felt. I was right out there, but I didn't feel vulnerable. I felt uh, just part of being one with the machine. Had a great time. Okay, so let's let's talk about the engine first. You've got a, a V-twin, well sorted. This motor's been around for a long time. What did you think of the engine? Incredibly smooth, uh, very responsive, and uh, I guess just typical Honda uh, power. It was, it was constant, it was there, um, and the rumble with the exhaust, the way it comes from Honda, was much more character than I ever expected, and I just loved it. I can't imagine wanting to change that sound that I experienced. Yeah, you sounded great pulling away from us on all those shots. Yeah. I, I had a lot of time, a lot of time to figure out how to 
get the most benefit of it from shifting, yeah. I backed off just to get that reverb back through the exhaust system, which I don't get in the other bikes that have, don't have the character that this one has. Now, going is one thing, stopping is another. I think what's really interesting about this bike is it's got ABS and linked brakes. What did you think? The linked brake, I'm sort of used to. It's, it's something a lot of people still aren't, but I've been riding linked braking for quite some time, and I love it. Uh, I wasn't in a, a feel of rush. Mm -hmm. uh, I wanted to be much more mellow riding the bike. Very solid braking for what this bike uh, gives you. It's just that whole attitude of slowing things down and really enjoying the ride. Now, tell me about the, uh, the riding style. You're a little taller than me, so how did you find the seating position, the riding position? Yeah, I guess I, I was thinking that maybe it was too low because I, I jokingly sat down in it, and that's the lowest seat height I've been on for a long time. I swear I heard my ears pop right. when I got down. I think it's around 27 and change for a seat height. Very low, but again, this was all part of that sitting in. And yet when I put my feet up on the pegs, because they weren't directly underneath me, mm -hmm. it was a relaxed fit. The handlebar placement was, uh, was so with the whole pack and the ride that I got was what amazed me. It was firm yet compliant. It didn't uh, jostle me around, but it wasn't sport bike firm, but I had a good feel for the road. Finally, you know, bikes like this are all about chrome. You know, I think half the, the fun of owning one is polishing it on Saturday morning. So chrome and paint. I, what did you think of the presentation? Unfortunately, right here with the, the, the cloud cover we've got, we're not really getting the benefit of this jeweled paint uh, that Honda has, and they've done some fantastic work on it. This red is really, really alive. The sun came out for a little bit on the ride this morning. But yeah, the, like you said, the, the, the chrome display as you see it yeah. is absolutely phenomenal, but it is a beautiful looking machine with the chrome uh, enhancements that they did all over the engine and the exhaust. So who do you think this bike is meant for? Who, who do you think would, would appreciate riding a bike like this? You know what, if I was going to get into touring as a part of my ride, I could see doing this. I don't need bigger because my whole attitude, like I say, changed. I slowed down, I just enjoyed the scenery, and I wanted to back off. For somebody that's thinking about moving up into a touring bracket, so many of the larger bikes are 1,000, 1,200, 13, 1,800 cc. Sometimes biggest is not best. Right. I think this one has all the character you could possibly need. It's, it's an impressive looking bike no matter who looks at it. The feel with the handlebars and everything else says, I'm a big bike in, in disguise. I think uh, anybody would be pleasantly surprised that wanted to get into touring about how, uh, how this fits the bill. Well, Ken, you've done a great job for us today. i got to say, it was a lot of fun listening to you uh, blap, blap, blap down the road. It yeah. was a blast. Yeah, I, I said, I, oh, that's another thing I developed right away. I've now got the twitch for blipping the throttle. Never had that before. <laughs> that's standard equipment. Nice work. Had a great time. Thanks again, Ken. Great job. You know, I never pictured you as a closet cruiser rider. Who knew? Now, don't touch that remote. There's still plenty more experience still ahead. Next, during our visit to Newfoundland, we continue to chase the explorers and discover the Bonavista Peninsula. Stay with us. Portions of Motorcycle Experience are brought to you in part by Honda, BMW Motorrad. Closed captioning of this program is provided by Motovan. Man, this stuff smells like bubble gum. Welcome back as Torta Truck presents the experience. I'm Dave Hatch and it's time now for this week's BMW Ultimate Ride from Newfoundland. Today, Norm and I are off to Bonavista. Recently, Norm and I kicked off yet another Ultimate Ride when we touched down in St. John's, Newfoundland. Last week, while exploring the Bonavista Peninsula about three and a half hours north of St. John's, we checked out one of the oldest European settlements in North America, the tiny village of Trinity. There we were blown away by the beautifully preserved historic buildings, the Rising Tide Theatre and the Twinelofts Carrot Cake, a perfect mid-morning snack washed down with warm coffee. This week we'll pick up our journey as we find ourselves heading once again north on Highway 230. This time our destination is the 1497 landing site of one Giovanni Caboto, aka John Cabot, 
Apparently, when the Venetian explorer for hire landed here on behalf of Henry VII, he exclaimed, Oh, buona vista. Translation, oh, happy sight. Well, Norm, it's going to take everything within my power to not start singing, uh, this land is your land. <laughs> <laughs> I can't believe this. This is spectacular. It's beautiful, isn't it? And uh, this is so representative of the, of the Newfoundland coastline where we are right now with all the rock and the peat and, and you can hear the ocean crashing up against the, the jagged coastline. It's just beautiful and awesome. Yeah, now yesterday we were at Cape Spear and we talked about being furthest uh, east as far as Canada is concerned, but you know, this really feels like we've been coast to coast. I don't know what it is, but it's maybe it's that rock behind us. Well, it's because uh, we're right on the edge here, you know, and this is the closest we've been so far to the ocean, and uh, I just walked down there and could have spent the whole day just watching the waves come crashing in, but uh, yeah, this is definitely uh, one of the spots that you need to get to when you come up here. I mean, Bonavista is, uh, is a bigger town on the coast here, obviously, because of its history and, and um, all the different settlements that have come through here, but when you come to Bonavista, you have to take the ride out to uh, Cape Bonavista for sure. Yeah. Now, we, uh, we've just headed up here, we're exploring the Bonavista uh, pen Peninsula today, and we've ridden up from Trinity. It's not that far uh, on 2.30, probably 45 minutes, but really scenic, nice, swoopy, great road. Yeah, beautiful road, and again, very similar to what we see at home, um, but you can smell the ocean all the time, so yeah. you know you're not in Algonquin Park. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and, and Bonavista itself, very different as far as uh, the look of the village uh, compared to where we just came from Trinity very different again. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And, and uh, I mean, I don't know why, obviously it's, it's because it's probably been more popular at this end right here because of the fishing grounds that are right off the coast. So it's right. probably, it's a much bigger town too. I mean, Trinity was about 30 homes and I think the population here is around 20,000. So uh, sure. a very different environment. So definitely worth seeing. And of course, this is where John Cabot landed, right? Yeah, 500 years ago, 1497. First, uh, first piece of North American land he touched. So great, great piece of Canadian history here unbelievable scenery. I know we'll be taking photos for the next half an hour. And then from here, we're going to continue the loop. Yeah, start heading down the other side of the peninsula now. And uh, the road uh, hugs the coast for, for a while. And then again, you, you go inland, you know, you're back and forth on this peninsula. But I think we're going to see a lot of coastal road now going down the other way. And we all on our right hand side. So I'm looking forward to it. All right, man. Another ultimate ride. Wow, what a beautiful spot. And man, on that day, did we ever luck out on the weather. Be sure to join us again next week as Norm and I now head about an hour south on Highway 235 to the sleepy fishing village of Somerville. There we'll meet up with the friendly crew of the Lady Ella, just back from four weeks on the high seas off the coast of Labrador. And man, not only do these guys know how to set a net, but they can certainly prepare a pan of fresh fish. Still ahead, we're off to the woods as Brian Hudgens does his best to win round three in our six-part ultimate challenge, while Leaky dons the MX gear to throw a little mud. Welcome back as Toyota Trek presents The Experience. I'm Dave Hatch and it's time now for The Learning Curve. And this week, Aliki Carrion is gonna to continue to try to get you viewers who don't ride, get off the couch and onto two wheels. This season on Motorcycle Experience, Aliki's been exploring the various paths to getting you into motorcycling. Last week, she came up with a really interesting alternative to getting your potential motorcycle riding boots wet or in this case, Muddy, when she signed up for a beginner's course at the Ontario Off-Road Adventures facility. Here, you don't need a learner's permit, riding gear, or even your lunch in order to kickstart your two-wheeled hobby. While sampling the total beginner's course, located about an hour east of Toronto in the Ganaraska Forest, Aliki, who herself has been riding for over 13 years, also learned that dirt riding is a great way for parents to break up their daily routines and do something really cool with their kids. So Lori, what brings you here? Uh, my husband's been here a few times, had an awesome time, and this opportunity came up where moms and their kids 
could uh, learn how to ride, so we decided to check it out. My son's now old enough, just turned nine, so. So you brought your son with you. I did. Most moms wouldn't uh, volunteer that so easily. Yeah. Well, you know what? I'm a mom of four boys, <laughs> oh, so okay. I doubt spa days are in my future, so I figured I should really try something that would be fun for them. So how's Liam doing? He's doing really good. He's doing way better than me. I think he's, uh, you know, kids just get on and ride, whereas I'm a bit more cautious <laughs> trying to figure it all out. Don't want to look like a total idiot. So do you find that you have any challenges that you're facing? Well, it's challenging, but the instructors have been really good doing it, breaking it down step by step. So they make it easy on us just uh, going slow, working at your own pace, and um, we've been pretty successful. That's great. Yeah. So what's the highlight? What the has highlight? been the highlight of your day? I think just doing something you've never done before yeah. is always kind of fun because I never saw myself riding a dirt bike. And like I said before, with just being able to hang out with my son and do something that he enjoys. Mm -hmm. Maybe him seeing me in a bit different setting than the mom. You know, I'm actually on a bike. So that's been a highlight for me. I would definitely um, come back just to spend time with the kids and make it a family event. So Laurie, are there any benefits besides just learning how to ride? Um, I think any time you try something new, kids, um, they're challenged to grow in a different area. I think that boosts their confidence. The next time something new comes along, maybe they won't be as nervous to tackle it. Mm -hmm. And uh, for me, being a stay-at-home mom, it gets me out of the rut for sure and uh, just challenges me to grow in different areas that I never thought I would. And uh, yeah, it's, it's been a really good experience. Now it's contest time. You may recall that a couple of years ago, Motorcycle Experience toured the North Shore of the St. Lawrence from Kingston to Quebec City and visited more than a few forts and historic 1812 battlefield sites along the way. So in honor of the upcoming War of 1812 Bicentennial this summer, we've put together a brand new Riders Club contest. The 1812 Riders Club contest to be exact. All you have to do to enter is visit the MotorcycleExperience.ca website and join our email riders club. If you're already a Motorcycle Experience Riders Club member, then just reconfirm your email address. And that's it, you've entered. On June 3rd, 15 days before the 200th anniversary of the start of the war, we'll pick our winner. This year, we're giving away a very exclusive MV Augusta prize pack full of all kinds of goodies, including a limited edition hardcover book and a full face helmet. Good luck, everybody. Up next, Brian Hudgen gets lost and found in the woods. Stay with us. Oh, this one's going to be close. Portions of Motorcycle Experience are brought to you in part by Honda, BMW Motorrad. Welcome back to Star Trek Presents the Experience. I'm Dave Hatch and recently Brian Hudgen and I kicked off a series of six challenges designed to put Brian's riding skills to the ultimate test. In rounds one and two of our competition, held at the Canadian Motorcycle Training Service facility, Brian completed both cruiser rides in the dirt to win. With a score two to nothing, last week during round three, we presented Brian with a forest challenge that required the use of a GPS. Unfortunately, Brian failed to make the grade. So this week, we're gonna give Brian a second chance. But first, he needs a little schooling. Brian, this is Warren Thaxter, probably one of the most experienced adventure sport riders in the country today. He's going to explain to you how to use the GPS. Go ahead, Warren. Hi, Brian. Um, GPS is a wonderful bit of technology that uh, allows you to guide yourself anywhere in the world almost. There are three basic functions that you have to know here to find your geocache today. So the pointer points you in the direction you have to go to get to the geocache, the distance to the next, and this little black triangle here is you. So you just have to go in the direction that this arrow points and it's as simple as that. 
Now we pre-programmed this last night onto the GPS, but Warren, how did you do that? I see you've got your laptop here. Well, this is, a, like I say, a wonderful bit of technology and with a computer, some software and some mapping, you can lay out routes almost anywhere in the world, anywhere in the country. And basically that's what we did last night. We laid out this route and, uh, and hid the geocache. Um, we sent it by email, uh, pick it up on a computer, we upload it to a GPS and pressed away we go. Okay, so do you feel more comfortable now with how to use the GPS? I think so. Okay, it's telling us that the geocache is only 10 minutes away. You can see that by the countdown clock. Get there, find the geocache in 10 minutes, you've won the challenge. Right on. Okay, give it a shot. going to be close though I'm running low on time here it's not far enough hello Brian well huh? well done you found the geocache unfortunately you are one minute late. Oh. So I'm afraid you've lost this challenge. Well, at least I got my just desserts. Got some candy here. Well, I'm sorry, man. You failed this challenge. And as you know, this is a best of six. Right now, you're up two, but you're now down one. Well, what's next? Well, we've got another challenge for you right here in the woods. Oh. <sighs> All right, now things are getting really interesting. With the score now two for Brian and one for me, next week we'll crank things up with our fourth challenge. Or should I say, do our best to deflate Brian's ego. Well, that's it for this week's program, folks. We're all out of time. We leave you now with our roving reporter, Paul Connors. This week he's chatting with the owner of a 1953 Indian Chief. So till next week, keep your feet on the pegs and your right hand cranked. Bye for now. Hey Dave, I'm here with a rare old Indian. It's one of 11 bikes in Justin's collection. Justin, tell us about your bike. It's a 1953 Indian Chief Roadmaster. It's the last production year for this bike. Um, basically in 60 or 53, they did about 600 of them. Um, they're very hard to find, but this one here is an actual 52 but was sold in 53. I guess the dealer couldn't uh, unload it in 52. But if, as long as it's registered as a 53, they consider it a 53 motorcycle. Uh, Justin, I noticed you have a, what we call a suicide shifter and a foot clutch on this motorcycle. Tell us what it's like to uh, ride and operate this bike. Well, you have to be very coordinated to ride this bike because uh, like you said, the foot clutch, you have to coordinate it with your hand shift. This is a three-speed transmission. Uh, basically first, second, and third. And uh, it's, it's a little difficult to get it coordinated with uh, the foot clutch. Listen, uh, I'd like to sit on it. May I try it? Go ahead. Wow, this thing has quite a bit of weight. Yeah, but it has the power to carry it. It's an 80 cubic inch engine. Well, uh, Justin, it's an interesting motorcycle. Uh, it'd be a, a challenge for me to ride on. Thank you very much for bringing it out today. My pleasure.